stuff here first of all i want to cover this uh intro video okay so i think a lot of people myself included when we were doing the intro video with you were like here comes uh, harvey and suits and the the music and the badass and you sent over like that intro video it's like maybe the people are like what the hell was that i don't know why did you send that video as the intro so first of all i don't have anybody making sizzle <laughs> i did not want to spend the time going, oh, what shot can I use, or what scene, and there's plenty of that stuff on the internet, and some of you probably cut things together, and I appreciate the love for Harvey and all that stuff. Being a speaker here at Aspire is that um, when I was a kid, um, there were three massive, uh, there were three people in my life that were huge inspirations to me and there's you know a number of images and and movie stars and actors and stuff where i see what they're doing right so my father's an actor he's here um part of our personal history is i didn't grow up with my paternal grandparents my father's parents um, passed early on when i was probably five or six that he lost his parents in this big fire, in this uh, San Francisco fire, on this um, mini this mini series called The Immigrant. And I remember seeing the pain that he was going through, and I knew, okay, so this is my father. I know he's playing a character, but he's telling a story. But this is resonant for him. This is something that's inside of him that he is able to express here, and that's beautiful. And I knew, as like a child, as like a five, six year old, going. This is deeply touching to me. He's in his journey, and this yeah. is amazing. Yeah. That was probably the first moment where I said, I want to do it, and sing and dance and all this stuff. And people ask, why'd you become an actor? It's because some asshole clapped. Well, that asshole's sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> um, addition to my dad, my mom was also go and tell stories. And it may have been, we're talking with the adults, go into the other room, go tell, go figure out a little play, come back here and put it on. Yeah, yeah. And that support of coming back in and having people support that was amazing. When I was six or seven, my folks took me to Westwood and we saw the movie Hair. And when I saw this film, it just lit up such a world for me in that there was this freedom, there was risks being taken, there was just this like joy. And I remember sort of this culminating, this, this idea of sitting in the theater, watching this film, being so touched by his performance and the movie, Milos Foreman. And I said, I'm gonna make a movie with that guy one day. And a year later, I played his son in a film called Why Would I Lie? I was eight years old. Wow. And that, the beginning of this journey of, some people say dream, some people have goals. I was sort of as an envisioning of my future. Yeah, yeah. And really sort of, I don't know if you call it hope or what, but it's how is the universe gonna bring that to me? And how am I gonna make that happen? Whether it's through education, whether it's talent, whether it's luck, whether it's confidence, whether it's the insecurities or the whole picture. Yeah, so yeah. I wanted to honor Treat because last year he was he was uh, in a motorcycle accident and it, and, and it took his life and he was a big inspiration to me and um, I wanted to honor this moment and give, make it a tribute to him. I see. And you see the movie and you start at seven years old using your words envisioning, creating a goal, creating a dream, a vision of you 
uh, co-starring with Tree in the movie. A year later, you literally play his son thing happening, and that's what you became hyper-focused on. You saw it, created it first, and then drove yourself to that piece. Did that happen other times in your life as well? Absolutely. I think it's happened throughout. And then, and I think that the moments that I actually get lost uh -huh. and feel sort of unmoored mm -hmm. is when I'm not doing that work. When I'm not just calming down, stopping what I'm doing, closing my eyes and saying, what is it that's there for me? What's, what's on this other side? What is the gift of this failure? Or what is the gift of this mistake? If I open the door, if something didn't happen, rejection, right? We've got a lot of rejection in this business. I think there's rejection in every business. Yeah. Um, I think it's, you know, it's those moments where I try and sit with myself, come back to who I am and what is my, is my where is my spirit? Because I think, some, I read something recently, it was like, the first half of your life is so egoic and you're trying to accomplish, you're trying to, you know, sh show what it is, prove, prove yourself, yeah. all this stuff. And then at a certain point, the proving doesn't necessarily mean so much and yeah. you become the spirit, the spirit of who you are. And so I have always, with the support of my folks and my family and my, uh, my, my wife and kids and all of those around me, try to come back to the spirit of goodness and, and go from there. Um, but there's also been moments of like, you know, where do you want to live? Well, I don't know if I want to live in LA my whole life. I want to see the world. Well, maybe I'll live here one day. Maybe I'll live there one day. Maybe I'll live there. And I've been able to live all around the world. And that has been a joy for me. You get to see the other. You get to experience what other cultures are going through in communities and see how how that can resonate with yourself and how you can move forward and grow, you know? Because everything is, excuse me, everything is changing all the time. Yeah. It's always adjusting, always moving in life, especially in life, but whether you, you take life from, even from an actor standpoint, but from a business standpoint, from a husband standpoint, from a father standpoint, it's always adjusting and moving. And you always have to continually adapt to what's happening to stay in front of it, to stay successful. Let me ask you this on the vision part, because I, I find it very unhappy. happen. And then how do you, uh, as a person, adjust from that? Do you, is it you create just a new vision, set that aside? What do you do when you have a vision or did it ever happen to you? You had a vision and it didn't work out. And what did you do from that? So, I don't know if I've shared this before, but I, I was, um, so I went to uh, Carnegie Mellon University Drama School. <laughs> Conservatory acting program. I wanted to go learn my craft. Um, and uh, I graduated from there and went straight to New York. And I was doing bit, bit pieces here and there, sitcom and, you know, independent film and movie here, and a play here. And I got the opportunity to do one of the plays that I, um, I actually did this play in high school called Cyrano de Bergerac, where I got to play Cyrano. Okay. And it was incredible experience, so much going into it, it's a, you know, little, a, a small play, but it's a gigantic, gigantic role. Um, and I played the part of Cyrano. So when I got into the professional world, I went and I got an audition to go play Christian, who, I don't know if you know the story, if anybody saw Roxanne, the movie with Steve Martin, it was based on Cyrano de Bergerac, right? And Edmond Rostan, Rostan, Edmond <laughs> Rostan, whatever. Anyway, <laughs> this is the player, right? So I was doing the rehearsals for Christian. I did five weeks of rehearsals, and then you get about six weeks of previews, and then you open on Broadway, off Broadway, whatever it was. I did a week of previews, and after that week, I was told I was gonna be replaced. <laughs> so this was the first time I got fired, and I was like, oh, shit, I guess. This is horrible, this is terrible. It felt like an anvil just dropped on my head. I thought this was the time to make mistakes. This is the previews. This is where you can fall on the floor. This is what you can do to learn what's working, what's not working, yeah. so that when the critics come, the last three days, you open and you got the play. Yeah, yeah. And it's set. Well, for reasons that are beyond me and I won't go into, 
it turned out to be a blessing in a way because, well, the play crashed. It was terrible. <laughs> but, but anyway, I learned that you're going to make mistakes. You're going to fail along the way. And what's behind it? So I learned how to snowboard. <laughs> and I went and I snowboarded for a while, and that was what brought me a joy of something else that was something else. And somebody told me that you haven't made it unless you've gotten fired. So yeah. I thought, okay, well, this is just one notch that I... No, I got fired. Exactly. Do it. I got another series, and I got fired after the pilot. Things happen, you know? Yeah. And I think that that shows a sense of resilience. It shows a sense of... You know, can you perform? Think so. If, if something's not going your way, if it doesn't happen for you, I don't think it was meant to be. Right, right. So I think there's something about sitting with that, possibly grieving that, seeing what you could have done better, what you could have done, you know, what was wrong with it, and then pivoting and going, this might be a blessing, this might be the gift to, to look over here and find what this is. It was a hard thing for me in life, like growing up, it was probably, yeah. and I would get so frustrated. I would just keep pushing and keep pushing beyond where I should have pushed. I should have like walked away or whatever it was. And it was later in life, kind of what you said earlier, where it's like, um, now it's like more of you prepare, you do everything that you can do, you practice, you rehearse in the example you were giving, and, uh, and you want to be, right? Sometimes in uh, life now, it is very common for entrepreneurs to struggle and uh, creating space sometimes for their kids uh, inside of it. Uh, meaning, is it okay that they don't go to college? Is it okay if they just go to become entrepreneurs on the get-go? Uh, what would you say of how much that helped you having parents that created space for you to let you figure out who you were through that process versus having to follow a certain map that was maybe their game plan versus allowing you to develop and grow into who you were uh, in life? It's a great question. Um... I think that when it, you know, I'm learning right now, I'm in a place right now where I'm uh, learning about boundaries okay. and healthy boundaries. Yeah. When it's okay to say yes and when it's okay to say no. Right. And when it's all right to possibly have a space where it doesn't feel right and it doesn't feel good, but it needs to be made, made known, yeah. right? I think there was a, I think there was a, a, a dance that we played in my house, which was like, there were not many boundaries in my mind. You talk to my mom, she'll be, of course there, there <laughs> we didn't let you go out in a car ride without this seatbelt on. You know, anyway, I'm joking, but sorry. <laughs> um, look. My father said, I, I could have gotten an agent when I was 16, 15, 10. They said, no, we don't want you to be in the business. They, they, I, I did that film, they took me right out. Okay. They said, this is not gonna be your life. Plus my mom didn't want to be a stage mom. She didn't want to go and travel and sit on a set all day. And I don't blame her, it's, this is just not her thing. My father said, you want to you act, you go learn what you're doing, you go get your craft done. So I had to audition, I had to go to college and do that. So there were those boundaries of like, but as far as creating the space for me to become who I was, I think that was done beautifully. I had super, like amazing support. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that, yes, education is very, very important. And I would also say there are plenty of entrepreneurs that didn't go to college and are super successful. I think there are different ways of education. I'm not convinced that our education system is, is the best education system. I don't know what is, but I definitely believe in more progressive education and hands-on work. Um, I think it was sort of, you know, education was brought about because they wanted to take the kids out of the workplace, right? So um, whether or not it was the right thing. I think that's where our society has come, and that's where we're at. And I, I, I don't want to speak to that. I'm not. A, I'm not a uh, expert on this stuff. But um, I believe that there are so many different routes to how one can make it. it. Doesn't mean you shouldn't get your education. It's good to have your, you know, your foundation. But then, 
if you have the ways and means to explore what you can in a different way, all to you. And, and, and I would do that for my kids as well. As well. Let me, let me shift over to, if you can, I know you guys all want me to talk about it. I get it. Uh, I understand it. I'm not crazy. Uh, but uh, let's just talk about that actually for a second. Like, you know, here's, here you are as Gabriel, the, the human, the person, the real actual person. And then there's Harvey. And uh, so many people know you only as Harvey. How, does, how, do, you, how do you play into that uh, process of what people know and see and think about you as this person versus maybe who you really are? Or was it a case where who, a lot of who you really are inside actually came out inside of Harvey? Uh, naturally, without you being able to control it or not control it inside of it. Are you similar to that character or is it two totally different people, would you say? That's a great question. So I don't know whoever's followed me and maybe I've shared this, but... So on the page, Harvey, we were talking earlier, is a um, type A, aggressive, testosterone-driven, narcissistic, yeah! <laughs> no! <laughs> um, uh, no! He is a, you know, an assassin and a deadly guy who's gonna go and close the deal and is, you know, blowing himself up and full of himself. Not to say he isn't bright, not to say he isn't Oh, he's manipulative. I mean, you know, he is all of that, right? I'm a very kind, nice Jewish boy. <laughs> um, so I saw that on the page and I saw that character as being someone who's like, wow, this is cool. I want to play that guy. This yeah. is like an anti-hero and, you know, all of that. The whole first season, he is this driving force of corporate, you know, controlling, scoffing at the people around him. But underneath the entire time, he has a heart of gold more than anyone, you know, not more than anyone, all those characters on that show had, had heart. Um, and, he, and they believed in each other and they supported each other, all that stuff. So when I first started to play him, I was pulling behaviors from my agent. I was pulling behaviors from my family members that are aggressive and, you know, no bullshit. I was pulling all this different stuff. Yeah. And my brother asked me a couple of years into it, he was like, what do you think, Helen? How, how close do you think you are to Harvey? Right? You. Yeah. I was like, I'm not anything like him, you know? I like the Grateful Dead and wearing my Birkenstocks and, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not this guy. I, don't, I only wear suits to funerals. Hmm. And uh, he said, I would, I wonder, I would, I would explore that because maybe you're more like him than you think you are. Wow. And so here comes Harvey. And by the way, I am not a method actor because I do believe you can use your imagination and at the end of the day, you can leave your character at work and come home and be you. When you're on set 12 to 14 hours, 16 hour days for seven months a year and you are playing at this level of aggressive behavior and you know, putting people in their place and all this stuff. Yeah. That was a reach for me to get there. That was a real reach. And the, and the directors would say, more, give it more. We gotta, we gotta bring more. And I'm like, I'm not this guy. Well, you are right now, be this guy. <laughs> and I'd have to get there and amp it up. And I started becoming that. And I would take that home with me and that did not work. Wow. You definitely didn't work. And I've taken a very big, long, wide berth and break from playing him to come back to who I am so I can wow. let him go. Now, with that said, I am super appreciative of the opportunity to play him. I am super grateful for the opportunities that have 
that playing him have given me. And I see how he is um, someone that has resonated with fans. And there's something in that that I can't take for granted. Yeah. Because my future in some ways, and I don't know if we'll talk about this, but is like, what is the brand of an actor? And how do you create a brand? What, you know, I was always like, don't ever do television because you'll get into a box. You become that guy and no one will ever see you as anybody else. I'm a, I look at myself, try as, my, as best as I can to be a chameleon, to do this guy, to play, you know, Frank James in, in, in a Western, you know, Jesse James' brother, I can be an airplane pilot, you know, all the different characters, because that's what I want to do is tell stories and different, but this guy stuck, this guy became who he is. And, you know, I count my lucky stars and I think it's a real blessing. And now I have to see, like, what you guys are all trying to explore is, like, what is my brand? How do, I, how do I use that to the best of my ability? And so right now, it's like, how do I take Gabriel, who, who I am at this age, and what I was able to present with Harvey, and how do these guys come together? Yeah. And how can I play with that moving forward in the ways that I want to create? Yeah, yeah. So even as a, it sounds like became Gabriel, and then you had to go back and uh, unattach from it, if you will, and go back to your your alignment of who you are as a person, uh, which was say not the hyper Harvey um, side of things. Um, talk to me about uh, just for the fans that are that are here that sent me ten thousand DMs um, about you. Uh, give me if you can. Was there a favorite? scene or episode or a favorite memory let's say, say that way a favorite memory that you have i mean this show has been one of the most downloaded shows on netflix uh uh i think i think right now it's the number one downloaded show on netflix right now um that's going on so you, you have like when it was played but then you have actually even more followers after that it was kind of over and everybody's going through it uh, tell me maybe one of your favorite memories that maybe you, you've never shared before so your diehard Harvey Suits fans people can say hey we learned this about Harvey today what was a favorite memory you had of the show if you will um oh gosh I gotta think favorite memory this is where my memory <laughs> flies um were you and Lewis really that argumentative in real life mm. no 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 we definitely you know fooled around we would rib each other and you know we we i think we get each other and, you know he's amazing he's amazing rick kaufman is amazing um so talented and such a great art chemistry rival and yeah. chemistry we had i mean i i i mean i'm so fortunate to have had all the chemistry that i had with all those characters um uh one of the funniest moments, I think, was when I... One, one of the greatest moments was when I... I think he showed up to set with braces. Mm -hmm. That was just a real oh, memory yeah, for Lewis, me. Lewis, Lewis, Lewis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I remember that one. That was, that was, that was awesome. Uh, look, I, you know, my father played Professor Gerard on the show. Um, so that was, you know, that was a joy for me to work with him and, and be on set with him. Um, I directed a few episodes, and I oh, wow. really enjoyed directing. I think that was probably my most fond moments because it was the most creative that I was able yeah. to. You know, working with a team of designers and um, actors and, and just being able to find a different, you know, rhythm and flow and creativity. And when you're working with all the different, you know, uh, all the different categories of, of a production, it's just a lot more in, um, creative than creative just side. standing up straight and saying the line. Then realize, yeah. Uh, let me ask you this. Uh, you seen this T-Mobile ad that we did? Uh, yeah, Super Bowl, right? Yeah, yeah we did Super, Super Bowl ad, and that was, you know, that was a lot of fun. You know, sort of taking the, taking the, you know, out of each other, um, and and sort of winking at the characters. You yeah. Know? Um, I think that there are short. Um, bits and pieces of some branding that I'm looking into, some products, and um, sort of uh, linking arms with some people that have some products and seeing how I can be the creative and selling sort of 
where, again, like I said before, where Harvey meets Gabriel yeah. and how we can tell that story together. And maybe you see me as Harvey and maybe you see me as Gabriel and how they interact with each other so that you see the corporate guy and the everyman. Yeah. And how they can align and create uh, or, or tell a story to, to a specific market. I think it's very unique how you're saying it because you're saying, uh, I like how you're saying it because you're saying uh, not leaving Harvey, not uh, uh, blank. And this is the uh, sign that we, we have. I have, I don't know, two, three hundred of these in my office uh, with all the people we've interviewed. Uh, it just says money is uh, blank. And whether it be one word, three words, five words, whatever it is. But if I asked you, uh, and what I should have done, I should have had two signs. I should have a, a Harvey one and a Gabriel one. I'm going to do that. We're going to have to rebook you. And next time I'm going to do the other sign to see which one you would say. Uh, but on it, uh, what would you say for Gabriel this time? You talk about, you know, money is an awkward, kind of a tough subject to talk about. But we just look at it and say, money is what? What would you describe? What does money mean to uh, Gabriel? Money is blank. Uh, well, first I want to say you taught me a great lesson okay. when I saw a piece of you uh, speaking about where the word money actually comes from. Oh, yes. Uh, the, the money is, you know, the old word is currency, currency and the current and moving. And moving money is how you make money. Yeah. I thought that was genius. Write that down, someone hurry. <laughs> take, that, take that. You got a story for that? Okay, good. I thought that was great. <laughs> um, for me, I think money is uh, responsibility plus integrity equals action. Okay, responsibility plus integrity, integrity equals action. Action. All right, those are three different words there. Just high level. What does that mean to you? Why do you, Why did you come up with that answer? Very unique answer. There's a. It's like an equation there for you. It's yeah. not one word. It's like if I'm responsible plus with integrity it equals action. What, what does that mean to you? I think it's just that. I think it's if if you can be responsible with your money, and that might mean. You want to save it, you want to invest in this, you want to diversify, you want to invest in this and this, whether it's real estate or jewelry or cars or whatever it is, um, your toys, you know, investments, any investments, you guys know all this stuff. Um, and then, and then uh, something that is integrity, that, that you believe in, that yeah. tells the story that you want to support. Um, and that equals the action of making more, maybe, oh, wow. all of that. That's how I see it. Interesting. So it's the responsibility of, I'm going to go back to what you talked about, responsibility of moving money, whether it be, like you said, jewelry or real estate or whatever it is, responsibility of moving it, but moving it with integrity. I mean, meaning, what's crazy if you ever think about this, uh, sometimes I get this illustration that, that you could take a $100 older one, right? That $100 bill could have been used for bad or for good. Right, it could have been responsible or irresponsible. Right, someone could have used that that actual hundred dollar bill to buy drugs or something, right, cartel or whatever it was. Right, uh, at the same time, the hundred dollar bill could have been used to uh, give to someone's mom to pay a bill for him. Right, but it's the same hundred dollar bill, and that's the responsibility side plus the integrity side of it uh, equals the action side for you, which will generate more revenue. I love that. Man. That's a very very. Damn, that actually might be one of the best answers as I've thought about it. Like, one of the best answers. How much do I owe you? Yeah. <laughs> now, what I want to do is I, I want to come back later and hit, hit you with the Harvey side. And instead of having Gabriel down here, I'm going to put Harvey down here. And I want to see what Harvey's answer would be. So I'll let you think about it for next, uh, next time. I'll think about it for next time. Which means I'm putting on the spot that to rebook you, again, don't be awkward about it. Uh, but last words, I'll give it to you right now. We gotta go. Last words, uh, 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 Gabriel. What would you like to say? All the people here came here to see you. That they're in business, they're successful. But what, what would be a piece of advice you'd give them in, in life and in business and success right now? I would say again, be responsible to you, and know that there's so much failure in in business in so much failure, so many mistakes being made, but they're all sort of little lessons yeah. to put in your back pocket so that, you know, I've got this one thing where I feel like 99 knows you'll definitely get one yes, and that one yes might take you everywhere. So keep on going. You know, if you can, if you can do your 10,000 hours and make sure you know what you're talking about, you're definitely going to hit something. I love it. You guys give uh, Gabriel a hand here. Give it up, let's give it up for Gabriel Mack, everybody!
Everybody!